All right, we'll get started. Um, it is a mouthful of a title, and I promise I'll do better halfway through, but you've got to hang in halfway through to get a better title than that. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a class of moderately unloved and unknown deposits within the North Parks District and the implications that that has for exploration both in the Macquarie Arc and regionally. Uh, so we are looking at the fluid rock interactions to failed overpressurisation in intrusion host of wall rock porphyry systems. So we're looking at porphyries that intrude earlier um, granitic or intrusive suites. So think babushka doll. So first cab off the rank, if any of you are silly enough to make an investment decision based off what I say, go for your life. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, just hold back. So I'm going to go a bit global first. I'm going to talk in a mineral systems context. And this is a really good model work that has been pulled out of the oil and gas space and um, Knox, Robinson and Wyborn and pulled it together into a really neat model that looks at how we get stuff that we're interested in into an appropriate space for us to discover and explore. So simplifying that model out, we end up with a source, a fluid, a trap and an outflow. And a lot of work that has been happening in the research and industry space has been looking at that source and fluid component. You'll hear a lot of work that's been done around magma fertility, particularly in porphyry systems. I'm not going to touch that, mainly because I suck at it. But what we're going to be looking at is the expiration critical end member, which is the trap and the outflow in the porphyry environment. And what's critical there is the formation processes that are happening in the shallow crust and the signatures that it gives us for expiration targeting. So most people have already been well and truly primed for where we are in the world by the talks earlier on today, and I thank the previous presenters for that. So we are in the Macquarie Arc, and we are in the Juni Narromine belt of the Macquarie Arc. And I'm going to be talking about these intrusion-hosted systems um, throughout our district, but you will find examples of these types of deposits throughout any of the camps in this belt or the island arc sequences globally. Zooming into North Parks itself, most of the previous research and any other time that you've probably heard people talk about North Parks in a presentation context, you would have been hearing about the volcanic hosted systems at North Parks itself, particularly E26, E48, E22 and E27 deposits. These systems are hosted within an island arc sequence that's latest order vision to early Silurian in age, and they are generally described as silica saturated alkalic porphyry copper gold systems. I am actually not touching on that at all. We're going to be zooming into the red on that map, which is the monzonite suite that intrudes that volcanic package. And we're going to go in again and look at what intrudes the monzonites themselves. But before we do that, I would be remiss not to put some general characteristics out there in terms of North Parks. So, Laundry list at the moment has us at 22 porphyry systems discovered or defined to date and the definition that we use there is that you're able to put your finger on a causative mineralising intrusion. So we're at 22, of those eight have been in the last 15 years and six within the last 10. We have mined four systems to date, E22, E27, E48 and E26 and we will continue mining some of those systems well out into the future. We are planning to mine from another five um, deposits within the North Parks cluster. Um, I'll show you an image of that later on. The thing that defines North Parks, the boutique end of the porphyry spectrum, is their relatively discrete ore footprints. We are talking about small ore bodies, less than 500 metres of lateral extent on the material that you would call ore. The upside of that is, even though they're a pain in the butt to pin down, is once you're onto a system, it keeps giving. So most of the systems that are economic to date, we have defined to greater than 1,200 metres depth. E26, our backbone ore body, has been defined to 1,600 metres depth and is open at depth in terms of grade. The mineralisation and the alteration um, corresponds to the global porphyry models if you think about a concentrically zoned system where you would have in most potassic alterations surrounded by sodic, calc sodic or calc potassic alteration and out into an extensive propolytic alteration halo. If you're interested in the propolytic, I would really encourage you to read Adam Pacey's papers on North Parks. They are fantastic work um, published in Economic Geology. Above our systems, we are getting to grips with what is a well-defined philic 
to our Julic alteration zone. And if you're interested in the story, I would encourage you to have a look at the posters if you can. And Rhiannon Jones, who is our PhD student at UTAS, has been doing some fantastic work on that over the last couple of years. Generally speaking, our systems have this upright pipe-like geometry, but what I'm talking about today are the more amorphous intrusion-hosted systems, which generally are characterised by lower hypergene copper grades. So taking an oblique view of North Parks and the mining lease area, you can see the, coll the collection or cluster of porphyries that have been mined in purple, the things that we are planning to mine in green that we've got resources on, and a number of the porphyry prospects that surround the area. A couple of years ago, unceremoniously, we nudged through the million tonnes of fine copper produced and the million ounces of gold. We missed the chance for a party. We'll do it when we get to two million. If you look at what's left for us to mine, we have more than 600 million tonnes of material that is above the median and the mean grade for porphyry copper systems globally, and it's above the average tonnage. So total endowment, and I'm going to put this in gold equivalent because I've got an inferiority complex compared to Cadia next door, it's more than 23 million ounces gold equivalent. Talking about the spatial context of our systems and the restricted scale, you can see that each of the deposits you know, has a concentric zonation in terms of grade, but the footprint itself differs depending on the host rock sequence that is placed into and the complexity of the porphyries or the number of porphyry fingers that have been forced into that environment and their relative geometry. That's a whole other talk in itself, but what I want people to take home out of this is that the major factor influencing the variability in our systems is the host rock. We're seeing consistency in our fluid, we're seeing consistency in our magma chemistry. What is changing is the environment that it's being emplaced into and how much magma you have fluxed into that space. And again, playing to an inferiority complex, here's half of Elteniente at the same scale. So we are the boutique end of the porphyry world. We have an extensive intrusive history on site, and this is what I'm going to be dwelling on for most of the rest of the talk. So we have a series of monzonitic magmas that have been emplaced into the shallow crust over a relatively short period of time, confined by rhenium osmium and uranium lead dating, and it grades from earlier, more mafic compositions, which are generally more equigranular textured, larger volume magmas, to increasingly smaller magma doses with an increasingly fine grained ground mass or more porphyritic texture. The things to latch onto with this is our biotite quartz monzonite is considered to be a pre to early sin mineral host and the quartz monzonite, which is the reddest of the red rocks that you can see on that left hand side of the slide, is a mineralising intrusion that has emplaced itself within the biotite quartz monzonite and the prospects I'll talk about. So I'm going to hammer this point home again and again and again. For us, an expiration ranking factor is proximity to that large-scale monzonitic magma in terms of expiration targeting. All of our known economic deposits lie within 500 metres of a contact of that biotite quartz monzonite or within it. We have systems that are further away, and it may just be correlation rather than causation, but all of those systems that are further than 500 metres away tend to be sub-economic and limited in scale. The porphyries themselves are emplacing into that shallow crustal environment along planes of weakness that correspond to cooling fracture sets within that biotite quartz monzonite, particularly where it has a higher relief with the surrounding volcanic facies. Spinning that into a genetic model that was developed by Vanessa Lickfold, we've got an emplacement of the magma chamber into the shallow crust, and then as it's cooling, kind of like bed, bread baked in an oven, as it's sitted out from the oven, it will shrink away from the edge of the tin. Particularly if it's got a little bit of fluid kicking around in it and it dissolves that fluid out, you end up with massive loss of volume and shrinkage. That promotes fracture planes which allow the ascent of later magma into the shallow crust. And this is our porphyries coming in and they develop that pipe-like geometry and we develop a zone with a hard carapace which is tapped either through seismic or structural events or by further shrinkage of the magma through cooling or fluid loss and that allows volatile X solution to occur and overpressure and spitting out the joy that is our copper and gold as well as the material that forms the non-sulphide gang in our veins. Each successive phase of quartz monzonite porphyry into the district is contributing metal, redistributing that which lied around already, and also is overprinting the alteration assemblages and the mineralisation that was present. 
as the system continues to wane, you will get philic alteration that telescopes itself in on distal assemblages, including propylitic, the structurally controlled telescoped over the ore system. So I've touched on this briefly and I'm going to hurry on because I'm going to run myself out of time here. There is no real appreciable difference bulk chemistry wise between the main stage mineralising intrusion. There are differences between the early sin mineral, late sin mineral and post mineral intrusions. But if you're looking at the early sin mineral intrusion in E26 and the early sin mineral intrusion in E48, the chemistry is broadly the same. So there's differences in oxidation that occur across the phases. But the spatial extent of the sulphide shells and zones around our systems is governed by the host rock and its porosity and permeability controlled. Either primary porosity within the host volcanic sequence or the permeability that's given by grain boundary diffusion in intrusions and that that's introduced by fluid overpressure and fracturing. So this is actually where we get into the shorter title. So let's talk about overpressure and what it means and why we should care about it. And I was trying to come up with something catchy and this idea floated around. So we're going to talk about what's the good, the bad and the ugly in the porphyry world. And I'm going to give you some examples of intrusion hosted systems that are got all the ingredients right and deliver us an economic discovery. And then I'm going to talk through a couple of examples where things have gone horribly wrong and one which it's almost gone right and it probably be good enough at some point in the future. We're non-violent though, so I better replace that with that. <laughs> it's probably safer. And in the interest of keeping my job, I better say that the things that I'm calling bad are, are just not as good as what we've currently got, because we'll probably mine them in the future. So the intrusion hosted clan of porphyries. Primarily here I'm talking about the beasts called GRP, E26, MJH and NERAD, although we're talking a little bit about some of the stuff from E48 at depth. These are systems that are either entirely hosted within that early to pre-mineral mon monzonite or emanate through it at shallower depths, but at depth in the system you can see the mineralisation associated with the pre-mineral monzonite complex. A couple of these things get to be a little bit exploration complex because the top of the ore shell has been truncated by a late low angle structure and it has dislocated the tops of the system. So we're basing this off what we can see. We're not seeing the tops of all of the systems. Spinning that into the context that our accountants like, which is grade or no grade, we're going to have a look at the grade distribution in our systems. And intrusion hosts and deposits, generally speaking, have a much broader low-grade halo that surrounds the higher-grade core. So in a volcanic-hosted system, particularly like E26, you will see that the grade, hypergene copper grade, drops rapidly from 1% plus to 0.1 over the space of maybe 100 metres laterally. In a system like GRP, or the depths of E26 and MJH, that change happens over the space of several hundred metres. So it's giving you plenty of warning it's also giving you plenty of clues to get closer, but you can get disheartened because you will drown in a sea of 0.4. So let's talk a little bit about the alteration while we're at it. And previously it has been mostly described as potassic alteration. Some really interesting you know, work that's been done on the whole rock geochemistry. There is a hell of a lot more albite in our systems, particularly these intrusion hosted systems than we have previously recognised. It is an albite dominant alteration setting. Case bar is an accessory. Volumetrically speaking, it's a sodium response that we're seeing. These systems are also sulphate stable, so gypsum and anhydrite is the go. When Mr Chapman was up here briefly and he was talking about having gypsum and bearite, he uh, got my Pavlovian association going and I was doing a little bit of a dribble there thinking about these type of systems. The alteration is red rock dominant, and you will see this in the literature talking about the extensive reddening that is associated with North Park style systems. And this is hematite that is being exolved from primarily plagioclase. You can have a couple of weight percent iron kicking around in the crystal structure of plagioclase. As soon as you start altering that, particularly with lower temperature alteration, something like that goes to illite sericite composition, you kick that iron out of the crystal structure and it needs a home, and you end up with red rock. The systems that we deal with in the intrusions are very low arsenic compared to some other systems like E48, E48 we have a couple hundred ppm arsenic kicking around associated with tenantite tetrahedrite mineralisation, top and bottom. 
These intrusion host systems are low arsenic contents. They are slightly elevated in zinc. So you see some elements there of what would be the usual geochemical zonation around your porphyry systems being telescoped in on your ore zone. So some of the pathfinder signature is overlapping with some of your distal ore grade. Better grades in our systems occur where you have an overpressure environment. No overpressure environment, grade sucks. Overpressure environment, fractured carapace, better hypergene grades. The challenge in these environments is because they are coming into an intrusion that has not yet fully solidified or still retains its latent heat from crystallisation, you end up with poorly defined intrusive contacts. So joining the dots between your intrusive phases gets to be a lot more complex. So before we talk about things that are not so great, we should talk about things that make things good. So, Generally speaking, coming back to that source fluid trap model, you need a fertile magma. The research that's happening in that space is really critical and really important. But picking up, once you have a fertile magma, you need a significant enough volume of it fluxed into the shallow crustal environment to make a metal budget to care about. And then you need a plumbing system to get it there and stall it at the right spot. So things that affect us at a local level beyond those fundamental controls is the environment that we're fluxing things into. And the primary porosity and permeability comes into play and also the heat of the environment that we're emplacing into. So let's talk briefly about the good. So E26 is a fantastic system. It production in 1994, you know, very briefly, and then we've had production from that continuing on to the present day. We have just started active caving in our next block cave, E26 Lift 1 North. Yes, it's a mouthful, no, not terribly imaginative in name, but that's 41 million tonnes of nearly 0.6% copper and 0.1 gram per tonne gold. It will see us out through the next six to eight years. And then underneath that, beyond Lift 1 North, we have an excess of 140 million tonnes of 0.6 to mine in that system down to 1,200 metres depth. We have more than 600 metres of that quartz monzonite porphyry complex, the grade givers, emanating through and above the stock environment and out into the volcanics. That is where we get our highest hypergene grades. The system has been very actively constrained by brittle, impermeable, volcanics, andesitic to trachytic in composition. And so you end up with very high hypergene grades. You know, lift one, 20 odd million tonnes that was mined at 1.4% copper and nearly 0.5 grams per tonne gold. Hypergene grades in some draw points, four to 6% copper. Fantastic stuff. In this environment, you can see the evidence of overpressure. And it's the rock that we see on the side there. You have your stockwork quartz bornite veining turning up. What porosity and permeability is there has been enhanced by that breakage and it allows more fluid pathways and more chances for fluid rock interaction to occur, allowing sulphide deposition. The veins themselves, most of the mineralisation is in or around the veins, so you will end up with vein-related disseminated mineralisation in the halo. So while you can think about the vein as the fluid superhighway, you have a whole heap of arterial roads that are surrounding. Think about Parramatta Road and everybody's shortcut way to get around something that's within a kilometre of Parramatta Road to get around a, a fluid blockage. That's the environment that we're working in. Because you have that high flux, brittle overfracturing environment in terms of fluid, the molybdenum that you would see occurs classic to the model. It's distal and outboard are the best of our copper. It forms a neat concentric shell. We have evidence that there is fluid leakage in this environment. We see the philic alteration, the work that Rhiannon's doing there. This is the smoke that's coming out of the chimney while everybody else is slaving away in the factory, which is the magma that brings the joy into our life. It has a classic pathfinder signature. You have concentrically zoned arsenic, moly, tin and tungsten responses, reflective of that magmatic volatile component streaming off the magma as it gets into the shallow crust. And as I said, the average hypersine grades when you're in the middle of it, it's pretty darn good. Overpressure. USTs. Everybody loves them. They're great. They're evidence of that successive overpressurisation event in a carapace. But if you're seeing them in an expiration context and if you're looking for where the grade is, you should already be in it. If it's not there, it's either streamed up and above and you somewhere need to look out and around, or the system itself had volatiles but no metal. 
So putting that into context, what we've got here is our grade shells, similar scale to what was on the previous slide. So the hot pink material in the middle is our grade driving porphyry, and the red that surrounds it in the wispy wireframe shell there is our 0.6% copper. And outboard of that, you can see there's a 0.3 copper shell. Plunging away across to the far side of the diagram, you can see this descending orange line, which is the contact of that biotite quartz monzonite stock. And you'll see the grade symmetry there, where inside the stock, that diffuse halo of 0 0.3 to 0.4% copper is probably double the width that you're seeing out into the volcanic package on the other side. So a lot of things to hatch onto here. Now I'm going to talk about the bad. So going back probably in 2016, we made some uh, assessments on historic data and defined a system called NERAD, which is a shallow monzonite stock hosted system. And it's a single mineralising phase with a couple of late sin mineral porphyry phases that turn up. It is a low volume of magma that has been fluxed into the shallow crustal environment. And what you end up with then is a very high temperature differential between the mineralising intrusions and the surrounding wall rock. But that is accommodated by the sheer volume of the quart biotite quartz monzonite that surrounds it. So you end up with a slow cooling environment in general. No contacts, lots of little dikelets of what looks like mineralising porphyry, but not porphyritic textured. So those intrusions have come up into the shallow crust. They are obviously fertile. We get great hypergene grades in the middle of that. Best hole is 255 metres of 0.55% copper and 0.34. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of body to it. So volume-wise, it doesn't make the cut. It's less than 10 million tonnes. The ugly for us is GRP. This deposit has been known about for a number of years and we continue to work on it. We're currently doing studies to determine its mining and sequencing going forward. It's kind of a hybrid between the two systems that we've just talked about, where we do have biotite quartz monzonite and quartz monzonite hosts, but we have a number of intrusive phases that have punched into this district of the same composition. So the volume of fertile magma that has been fluxed into the shallow crust is significantly larger than what we're seeing with NERAD or some of the other sub-economic systems. We tend to see that there is higher copper and grow gold associated with veining. So we have some breakage, but the vein geometries are not planar. They are undulating to wavy and they're commonly grain boundary controlled. It's trying to exist in a brittle environment, but it hasn't quite got there. You do see philic alteration streaming off the top of it though. And it's a really interesting system. So there's about 120 million tonnes of 0.55 and 0.1 gram per tonne gold in that system to follow. So what are the differences there between the fundamental controls, you know, between the good, the bad and the ugly? We've talked about the fertility of magma and if you look at the whole rock chemistry you will see very little difference in the chemistry of those syn mineral intrusions of the same time period. It really comes down to the amount of magma that you can flux up into the shallow crust and the environment that gets into. So if you put too little magma into a too warm environment you end up with a geochemical anomaly rather than a deposit. If you bring up too little metal into a too tight environment, you end up with something that's got a high hypergene grade but a volume that's not worth worrying about. So you really do need to hit that Goldilocks zone of something that is permeable but not too permeable and you've got enough magma to play the game. Given the timing, I might call it there. Any questions? <laughs>